welcome. And I'm here to welcome you to our uh, program, and the title is The Future of Seafood. I'm honored to introduce this program. I'm very much looking forward to what the chefs have to say tonight. This program is also being live streamed on YouTube, and I um, welcome all our online audience. Hopefully we have a lot of Oceanwise chef partners from across the country uh, joining us. Our vision at the Vancouver Aquarium is a sustainable world where aquatic life is diverse and flourishing. We started the OceanWise program nine years ago to educate consumers, restaurants, the seafood industry, and retailers about sustainable seafood and why choosing sustainable, ocean-friendly seafood is important to all of us. Joining me in the audience tonight are our two OceanWise staff members, Teddy Geach and Claire Lee, and they're here to answer any questions uh, after the event, so please ask us anything that you don't get a chance to ask uh, the chefs. We, we'll have about an hour of moderated questions, and then you'll get a chance to ask any questions to the chefs, and uh, same with online. We'll be uh, collecting any questions from any of our online audience, and we'll be asking those questions as well. So right now I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Mr. Guy Dean. He is a vice president of Albion Fisheries and Guy has been a huge supporter, ambassador and friend of OceanWise since the beginning of the program. So Guy. Thank you, Emery. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I gotta tell you, today is a fantastic day. Uh, why is it fantastic? I just spent the day skiing with my four-year-old daughter, and that was amazing. And then I came here, and I get to be involved with three distinguished chefs that are really the leaders in North America focused on sustainable seafood. So with today's theme and, and our panel, and my time with my daughter, it reminds me of, uh, of a favorite quote I have from Groucho Marx, don't ask me to impersonate, who said, uh, future generations, why do I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? So, I ask, boom, boom. So, why are we here today? We're here because we, we love seafood. We're also here because we're hearing that some fishes around the world are collapsing. So, what does that mean for some of our favorite foods? Uh, what seafood will we be eating in 20 or 30 years from now? And can we help? This is more important. Can we help? reverse the decline of fisheries. And will all the fish be there or will they be gone? So whatever your, our questions tonight and your questions, tonight's program will give us an opportunity to hear from three insightful celebrity chefs about the future of our, of our seafood. So let me tell you a little bit about our panel tonight. Tonight's panel are thought leaders. They've appeared before Parliament and Congress with their insight. But really, more importantly, they are influential chefs that are, ba that are making daily impactful changes just on how they operate their business day to day. I'd like to first introduce uh, Chef Ned Bell. Chef Bell is the executive chef and uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, executive chef at the Four Season U Kitchen. He's, uh, his cooking philosophy is farm to table. He's passionate about creating globally inspired dishes crafted with locally grown ingredients with an emphasis on sustainable seafood. Chef Bell grew up in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley and he studied at De Brule Culinary School where instructor Rob Feeney inspired Ned to follow him to Le Crocodile and later to the opening team of Lumiere, a restaurant that put Vancouver on the global culinary map. He honed his talents at key positions in Toronto, Niagara, Calgary, and Kelowna, and he was awarded Best Overall and Rising Star Award from uh, Wear Magazine. He's ranked as Western Living Magazine's top 40 foodies under 40, and uh, um, I've, as <laughs> he was ranked. I'm not 40 him. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this summer, he's actually he's riding his bicycle across Canada to raise awareness for sustainable seafood. In addition, he's a driving for force in promoting and cre the creation of National S Sustainable Seafood Day in Canada. Uh, Chef Ned Bell. Good evening. Thank you, Guy. You're welcome. 
Uh, let me, uh, number two on the list, and by no means number two, <laughs> Chef Rob Clark. <laughs> Chef, author, challenger of the st status quo. He's the advocate of authentic living, sustainable seafood, and transparency in our food system. Cooking for over 30 years, in 1997, Chef Clark joined the team at Sea Restaurant, and the next year, in 1998, he started moving the menu to sustainable seafood. After 15 years, he recently moved on to a new challenge and last year opened the fish counter with his business partner and marine biologist, Mike McDermott. Throughout his award-winning career, Chef Clark has been a champion of sustainable seafood, helping the Vancouver Aquarium create the ocean-wide sustainable seafood program. Chef, Ned, er, Chef Robert Clark, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and tonight, Last but certainly not least, we're happy to welcome Chef Rick Moonen. Chef and cookbook author, he's been the, the America's leading advocate for the sustainable seafood movement for the past 25 years, bringing national awareness to his subject that's near and dear to his heart. He has two restaurants in Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, Rick Moonen's RM Seafood and RX Boiler Room. He was the first in his class from the Culinary Institute of America and in 2013, U.S. Today named him one of Earth Power's players as, as one of five leaders helping the health of our planet. He's a founding member of Chef's Coalition, Seafood Choice Alliance, an active member of Wild Conservation Society, SeaWeb, Share Our Strength, as well as on the Chef's Advisory Board member for Ecofish. When not behind the stove, Chef Moonen can be found throughout the country educating consumers on ocean conservation and the dangers of overfishing. He's been featured on CNN, Today, Good Morning America, CBS, Early Show, Dan Rather's Report, and, and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Moonen. Do you want to cue to the video? We got a little video for you. I don't have to talk. <laughs> I'm Rick Moonen from RM Seafood. There's really two things that I hold dear to my heart. One is sustainability of the ocean, and the other one is I love to cook. Top Chef Masters has allowed me to share my vision of sustainability. Is that your devilish element? Well, yeah. If you don't like it, you can go to hell. <laughs> Here we go, one of these big ones. Have a good day. Thank you. Sustainability to me is not actively taking part in the extinction of a species. It's about stepping outside your comfort zone when it comes to the ocean. Try some mackerel, some cobia some farm-raised Arctic chart. Rick's meal was a story with this beautiful arc. That first dish of the spectacular oyster, I'm just gonna say the best oyster I've ever had, paired with that wonderful fish with the scallop. This was so precise. Sustainability is just a matter of respect, and this is exactly who I am. Rick's venison dish was extraordinary. The venison itself, the matsutake mushrooms, the pear butter, all were absolutely perfect My father was an immigrant from Holland. We go out to Long Island all the time, clamming together. The flavors of the ocean, I could smell the seaweed, I could feel the breeze. That's like my first memory of tasting the ocean. No one in my family was in the restaurant industry. I went off on my own, immersed myself in a field that neither one of my parents had any idea. If my mother or my father were still alive today, they'd be just extremely proud. Top Chef Masters has presented a challenge and an opportunity to me that I will never forget. Time's up, Chef. Rick, wow. From your dreamy glazed oyster to your perfectly poached egg, you have raised the bar on culinary mastery. Can I marry you? <laughs> Five stars. Congratulations. So Tears started coming to my eyes. I couldn't believe it. It just overwhelmed me. Overall, you've won $22,500 for your charity. Congratulations. 
That's awesome. Thank you. It feels unbelievable to reach a goal. I didn't, I didn't expect the emotional um, flood surge through my body at that moment, but it was exactly at that moment I realized how badly I wanted it. It felt fantastic. Anybody have any soy? Right here. Awesome. French classical cooking. Break it is best. I absolutely loved everything on the plate. Because of perfection. There was so much flavor. It was an absolutely beautiful place. I stand back, gobsmacked at what he achieved. Top Chef and Top Chef Masters is now part of my life. So <laughs> it's going to always be, I think. I got to tell you, this is uh, that's not media hype. I, I was uh, really lucky enough to, uh, in February of this year, uh, to uh, um, be invited for a special meal at uh, at the um, RMC food, and uh, it was amazing, truly amazing. It was fantastic. So, with that, why don't we get started with uh, the questions? And uh, what a good segue! Let's start uh, with you, Chef Moonen. Oh boy. <laughs> so, with the population growing from seven to nine billion by 2050, one billion malnourished or starving. There is consumed for food security in the future. Today, over 50% of seafood consumed globally comes from fish farms. Yet, responsible aquaculture is essential to pr preserve the existing natural environment. Is aquaculture a viable solution for future food security and the health of our ecosystems? Well, aqua, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, aquaculture is incredibly important uh, part of our. Uh, globally part of our, our, our daily consumption of uh, seafood. Um, like you just said, over 50%, and this is a statistic that uh, is, is recent, within the last year or so, um, where over half of what we consume globally that comes from the, from the water is grown on a farm. So it's kind of like the big elephant in a room, because for many, many years, um, growing carnivores in an open net environment is had many, many, many um, um, environmental um, backlashes. There's, there's really two areas when it comes to aquaculture. What, what is the impact on the environment, and what is the impact on the animal itself? Can you show that image that I that I asked you? The image. The image. I think he's gone on a break. He's on oh, a break. there he is. Okay. So this kind of tells you. Some, this sort of is a is a, a, a graphic of the concerns about aquaculture. And a lot has changed, which is good news. You know, um, aquaculture is fairly new. You know, it's really started to grab, you know, get some roots in the 80s. So it's not something that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So in, in that growth, and you imagine now that we're globally consuming over 50% of our daily uh, uh, food intake comes from farms, they had a lot to learn during that, those, those 30, 40 years that, the, that aquaculture has been growing in popularity. And it had a lot of impact. So if you look here, you see up there, they had to use a lot of drugs because uh, they put a ton of fish. You, know, you, made, you invested in a farm. You, you, you get the little fish, you put them in your nets, you're out in the open ocean, and uh, they stress out because you're putting more fish in one area than nature designed to have lived there. So you have to throw in some drugs because you're stressing these guys out. Stick a bunch of, stick, you stick 25 people in an elevator, sooner or later everybody's gonna get sick, right? I mean, it's just about stress. Um, up here, the uh, interaction of uh, non-native species. Well, you see that on, especially in, in the Pacific Ocean. Farm-raised Atlantic salmon in the Pacific. It's going to have, you know, non-native species can possibly have some major Im impacts. Escapes, you know, this, these are nets. The net's going to break open, fish are going to get out, then they're going to start eating, they're going to start eating the food that the, the, the native species need to survive. So there, there, there's, there's a com competition, and plus there's a chance that they could reproduce diluting a very, very important genetic code that, that is necessary for salmon to reproduce, find their way back to the rivers where they were born. Herbicides, these are, these are items that, so okay, you have these nets, and uh, the water has to exchange uh, from the inside to out, so the algae starts growing. They have to start putting these, uh, these uh, anti-fallant agents upon, on, on there. Another chemical, they use copper a lot of times to coat the nets, which is very, very bad 
for, for, uh, for fish. Carp messes them up. They can't, it throws off their navigation system. Um, fish meal and fish oil, because they're carnivores, the carnivorous fish, they have, you have to get fish to feed the fish, to make the fish. So the, the, the ratio of fish in, fish out was a big concern. It would take sometimes five, six, seven pounds of, of, of marine protein to make one pound of, uh, of, of, farm, of farm protein, not efficient. You're gonna run out of food that way. So today, they've gotten it down to where um, in certain, a lot of aquaculture, the fish feed, it becomes a net producer. It takes less than one pound of fish, marine, um, based food to make one pound of uh, one kilo. Sorry, talking in pounds here. <laughs> Low Vancouver. Okay, so so that that that's being that's being addressed a lot now. The predator control. They have um, a double netting in certain certain places so that so there's less escapes, less opportunity for uh, for um you know it's a smorgasbord. If you're an orca, well, you see this thing and you go, holy smokes. I'm gonna tell all my friends we're coming back in the night and we're gonna feast. So now there, there's better protection system. And it's not just shooting them, killing them, because then there's a lot of PETA and all these other organizations having an issue with that. And I don't blame them. We're trying to work with our environment. I had the I had the uh, All right. Um, <laughs> local diseases, in, in interaction of uh, sea lice, for instance, is an exchange of sea lice, which becomes a big problem. Native species floating around here. These guys are creating an environment where sea lice don't have a cycle anymore. They're around 12 months a year. Where sea lice during the winter months usually drops down. It's like mosquitoes. Where do they go? You know, in the winter time, they're back in the summer, and you darn well know it. Well, same thing here. Sea lice, they start to create it, and then it starts to have a major effect on the native species that are sw swimming by when they're immature. When they don't have a scale coating, that's when a louse can, can kill them. So that's, that's a big deal, all right? This is a big one here, though, sewage. The stuff that comes out of this system, you know, creates this um, um, sludge. It's a basic, it's basically, it's a recipe, as we're chefs, we like to use the word recipe. It's a recipe of uh, feces, dead fish, because they die, they go down, they become a part of this, uh, this effluent, it's called. And also, there's uh, some uneaten pellets, food. Food that doesn't eat. So it creates this suffocating blanket of death that kills everything that's living on the ground. This, the, the eel grass that's necessary for native species to uh, reproduce, hide in, so they can, they can hide from their predators. The um, crabs, starfish, everything that we eat, clams, mussels, oysters, all um, um, having an issue. There are much better uh, aquaculture um, practices today. They've learned. You know, they've, in order to uh, battle with the sea lice, they, they use, well, well if, you, if you made major million dollar investments in a, in a farm, and all of a sudden someone comes and, you know, hey, we've got a problem, what's the problem? We have sea lice, what's that? And it's only little things sticking to the fish and supposed on the farm. Well, how do we get rid of it? Well, they use chemicals in the beginning, and now there's different ways. They use what they call well boats, where they'll take these fish and they'll run them through a hydrogen peroxide solution, a solution and it helps to, uh, to eradicate the sea lice. All right, but this problem is major, the effluent issue, all right? So what they're doing now is, is called IMTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. Sorry for the long answer, but it was, it was loaded. Um, and um, what that is, is they're now farming next to these, these stuff, this, 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 this net here. Over here, they farm mussels, all right? And then next to the mussels, they'll farm kelp. And these three things can all be sold on the market, and one feeds off of the other. So the byproduct of the salmon feeds the mussels, the mussels feed that. So it's integrated, multi-trophic, because they're all different layers of, uh, of, the, of the food chain. So they all have, have work together to create, and, and they all become marketable, sellable. And basically what it does is it creates a healthier environment. What we're learning more and more, I don't know why it's taken 35, 40 years to learn that, healthy water, healthy environment, produces enough food to sustain us in the future. We're growing from seven billion to nine so food security is a major, major concern, and how we interact with our environment, how we take care of it, the globe that we grow, that we live upon, you know, that is what, over two-thirds water? So the globe is over two-thirds of uh, salt water ocean, right? And um, so is our body. We, we, we are more than two-thirds of water. I mean, when we're born, we're 78% water and it changes. But our blood is 90% water. Basically, we're just skin wrapped around an ocean. We're walking oceans that we can think and talk and interact. And if you don't believe it, taste your tears. Salt water, where is that coming from? Us, it comes from the ocean. That's why sustainability is so important because without a healthy ocean, we're not gonna be able to produce food. We're not gonna be able to enjoy wild species. We need to pay more attention to it. And that's a long answer. Thank you. <laughs>
But thank you. Now can you see why they're the authorities? <coughs> so, uh, so what I'm hearing is through continuous improvement, you, uh, over time what, what we're seeing is aquaculture is a viable uh, future, for, uh, has a viable future for the food I, industry? Is I, I it viable. I don't think it's a question whether it's going to be viable or not. It's, it's, it's undeniable that it's absolutely necessary, at least at this point, of where we are and I think where we're going in the future. It's just how we do it. You know, for, for years, I wouldn't serve farm-raised Atlantic salmon on my menu. And no way, I have it on my menu. Now, why? Because large companies are, st took to, you know, are taking notice and making major changes. You know, now there's a feed ratio that's net producing, uh, you know, proteins. They're taking care of the effluent with IMTA. They're, not, they're using less antibiotics because they're not, they're not uh, uh, populating their farms as densely as they used to. You know, and they're having healthier animals. They don't have to use as much or any antibiotics. And uh, the, the fish are happier, they're, they're living lives that are much more um, um, relevant to the way they would normally live. And um, native species is of, of another concern, but cer certain fa fish farms are using uh, uh, native stocks. They're, 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 uh, hat their hatcheries are, uh, are just utilizing the same, uh, the same genetics over and over again. And um, we are we're seeing, and so the thing of it is, are they perfect? No, they're not perfect. But they're much better. You know, this discussion about sustainability <clears throat> and, and the, the, the strive for perfection is, is, um, is what kills uh, any kind of progress. Or progress, I'm sorry to say that. Um, because, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we have to start a, um, um, recognizing better, and we have to like, figure out what metric do we start to uh, say, hey, I want to applaud that, I want to recognize that, I want to support that. Well, when it comes to certain Certain aquaculture um, practices, especially in the carnivorous, there are there are fish that aren't carnivores, which are great. Catfish, all the tilapia you want to eat, eat all you know, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We want some diversity in our diet. We do, as chefs, you do, as 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 you know, the general population, at least our belief. And how do we get to that? Well, it's about widening our our, um, our acceptance of what we eat paying attention to what's going on, how our food's being produced if it's farmed, or how it's being captured if it's wild. And so, yes, it's a viable. Okay, thank you. Chef Clark, You're not a little bit of a loaded question. question. You're not gonna yeah. ask me the same question, are you? How about make it easy for you? <coughs> wild versus farmed. Oh. Uh, well, I just, uh, just to touch on just the fact with Please. the aquaculture, there is, like Rick just mentioned, it's not just farmed Atlantic salmon that is farmed. I mean, our aquaculture industry, especially on the West Coast, like mu mussels, oysters, clams, those are all very, very green. Mm -hmm. I'm not told, I'm not obviously not an expert, I'm not a biologist, but I'm told like oysters, for instance, are the most sustainable protein we can produce because essentially no energy goes into its production. With the filter uh, Yeah, they're, yeah. Um, so, you know, aquaculture is definitely here. Um, Rick made some great points, the fact that uh, as far as farming uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, the move towards better and better, I'm sure they're getting better and better every year. And uh, as a society or as a group of people, we need to be able to, uh, to support it when it, when, when, and when, it does, when it does make sense. For farm versus wild, uh, that, that would segue into to, to that question. Uh, farm shellfish, of course, I'm, I'm behind 100%. You can't, you can't get a greener, a greener farm product. Um, one of the, I, I want to stimulate some thought more than anything else. And when, when, you, when you hear the debates about farm versus wild, um, they're always comparing uh, seafood. They never compare whether a farm uh, seafood of some kind, how it compares to a farm chicken or a farm pork or a farm, farm beef. Uh, and I think those, those questions need to be asked more because it is very relevant. Because essentially it doesn't matter where we do any farming, even for our vegetables, it ends up in the ocean. And for all of us here, what we care about is the health of the ocean. And as has been said already, the health of the ocean will determine the health of our, of our species. Uh, and we can choose, and through the history of man, we can choose. We've seen the tragedy of the commons, which this is what it's about, or the, the story of Easter Island, or the history of mankind. It's the exact same thing. We have a tendency to, to uh, not know when enough is enough. And I think as far as uh, the movement towards sustainable seafood, all the different NGOs that are, that are working hard to bring this question to the forefront is having a pot. Am I giving you a headache, Ned? No. no. He's asleep. <laughs> He's asleep. <laughs> nice. 
I was really uh, just trying to hear you a little better. Oh. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the thing. Education, understanding, and acceptance will help us all move forward as far as the sustainability is, uh, is concerned. And, and there is a place for both farmed and wild. For me, person, from a professional point of view, me personally, uh, wild, especially when you talk about wild salmon, is the single most important thing um, as far as seafood is concerned here in British Columbia. Because farming salmon is, you know, they do it in New Brunswick, they do it in Chile, they do it in BC, they do it around the world, but I think here in BC it's a different, it's a different, there are different concerns than in the rest of the world, and, and for me personally, those, those need to be, uh, to really be addressed. So. Just to clarify what I was talking about is, um, farm-raised Atlantic salmon in the Atlantic Ocean is what I'm really in support of. I'm not really keen on non-native species because that's when you end up in, with, with problems. You know, you have five beautiful wild salmon species that are still viable enough so that they're commercially available. The farm is Atlantic salmon. I mean, or, or Atlantic salmon still exist. There are Atlantic salmons wild, living, not enough of them to make it worthwhile. It's basically, they're commercially extinct. Yeah. You know, so you don't want that to happen, you know, in, 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 in BC, I don't think so. So that's not, I just want to make sure that I was clear on what I was saying. I'm not saying, oh, farm raised Atlantic salmon is great. <coughs> you need to know about where your fish is coming from. That's, certain that's certain farm raised Atlantic salmons doing it better than they used to do it. All these problems that you were seeing up there before still exist, if they, but, the certain, but, but some um, companies are saying, you know what, we're going to do something about it. And you see them moving. You're seeing salmon, farm raised Atlantic salmon moving in the, uh, in the assessments. Um, into different directions. Some farmers, the Atlantic salmon, are now being said that good alternatives are not necessarily a void. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, uh, Chef Bell. Um, <coughs> I see uh, quite a few actually chefs in the audience here tonight. And what Wait, you? <laughs> 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 Wake up. <laughs> From your perspective, um, and. You, you're so uh, committed to focus on sustainable seafood and bringing to light the, the uh, desire and the, the goal to uh, highlight sustainable seafood. So what are the actions that some other chefs and consumers can do to move the needle on the state of our oceans and fisheries? It's a great question. First of all, I'd like to say good evening to everybody. How are we tonight? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming. I feel... Uh, Really quite honored to be here tonight in front of you, but also, um, you know, shoulder to shoulder with these two giants. I basically stand on their shoulders um, of the work that they have done over the last 20 and 30 years. Certainly Rob Clark, not only a personal friend and a mentor, Rick Moonen, who I just met yesterday, but I felt like I've known for years because I've been following his, his passionate stance on sustainable seafood. I'm sort of the next generation, you know, the generation beyond me, maybe this little uh, little person here who uh, who basically you know as a father to uh, two boys I have a 15 year old son named Finn and a five-year-old boy named Max um, the giants of my life certainly when it comes to why I love what I do is because I feel incredibly fortunate to wake up every day and really love what I do and what a gift that is for me is as a father and as a human um, I just love to cook you know, at the end of the day, we call ourselves celebrity chefs. I think the only one that might call myself a celebrity chef is my mom. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm a cook. In fact, I'm, I'm a really good dishwasher. Um, you know, I feel, I feel incredibly fortunate because with the organization that I work for, the Four Seasons, um, you know, we're uh, very proud to be um, always striving for the goal of becoming 100% ocean-wise, you know. I like to often say that uh, we're the first luxury hotel in the country to be 100% ocean-wise, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, kind of from, from zero three years ago to a commitment of sustainable seafood, um, you know, I stare out at a couple of other giants in the industry, Frank Pabst from Blue Water, you know, some fishermen who, who are really my, my heroes um, in the back of the audience. You know, my food, I, I don't call it farm to table, I call it ocean to table. Um, you know, healthy lakes, oceans, and rivers are really healthy Canadian parks and wilderness, which is really then our country, which is three oceans surrounding, there's seven oceans in the world. Um, you know, I feel like if we don't do something now, 
We won't have wild seafood. It won't even be a discussion about wild versus farmed. And so that's something that we have to really pay attention. It's a great question to ask, but I don't know that there's an answer. Um, the, the only answer is awareness. For me, it's about raising awareness. Um, it's about education for m myself, us, the next generation. Um, and my, my BHAG, my big, hairy, audacious goal is to have sustainable seafood accessible to every Canadian within the next decade, and I think we can do that. Um, and that's why I'm riding my bike across the country, is to try and, you know, we live in the West Coast. We're incredibly fortunate. We live in a community, in a region, in a province that speaks about healthy life style, health and wellness, mountains, rivers, oceans. We, we wake up every day and get to stare at that. You know, you live in Winnipeg, Toronto, <laughs> you know, uh, Calgary, and you get to stare at the Rockies. But, you know, I lived in Toronto and Calgary for both five years each. I know what it's like to cook in those areas. And I remember when Rob Feeney, in fact, Frank was the chef de cuisine at Lumiere when we opened. Um, Rob Feeney was one of the first chefs to bring albacore tuna and sable fish to Toronto. I remember it happening and the, and the fish companies out there were, the hell is this? We've never seen this before. It was all about ahi tuna. It was all about, you know, um, farm salmon. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about wild salmon. And so you've seen in the last short decade, 15 years, this, this movement amongst my peers. Um, you know, we're... I'm by no means an expert. I'm just a passionate guy, you know? And my grandfather was a doctor, and he looked at me like I had a hole in my head when I, wanted, when I told him I wanted to be a chef because chefs were the guys carving roast beef at the country club on Sunday night. It wasn't a career, right? He was a physician. He had a sharp knife. And I said, you know, Grandpa, maybe one day my sharp knife can make you know, a difference in the way that non-traditional or traditional medicine, the way that he lived in, very traditional medicine. I'm sick. Here's a pill. Right? No different than this, the, the farm is sick, let's give it a pill. Well, how about we go back a little bit and try and work on health and wellness of our body or our environment that might actually affect change in all of the issues that we have. You know, I mean, really healthy oceans is healthy people, healthy humans. Um, you know, when I wake up every day, run to and from work, I'm taking care of my body. If I was you know, not doing that, I wouldn't be doing myself any favors. Well, you know, because it happens out in the ocean somewhere where we can't see, we, th we think it's okay. You know, think about like, if we, were, if we killed every animal in Stanley Park because we were looking for one cougar, would we let that happen? There's no way we would let that happen. But we let that happen in the oceans every day. And to me, that is just wrong. So what, you know, you go back to your question, all of us are quite long-winded, aren't we? <laughs> Your question of what I knew this can, was going to be a well, challenge first one for anyway, me. The first one. <laughs> what can we do is we can, I mean, the, the whole point of, the, of a movement like OceanWise is to make it easy. You know, it's a little stamp, it's on a menu, adopted from the Seafood Watch program. It's a little stamp, it's on a menu, it's in a retail grocery store, it's in a fish market like the fish counter, best fish and chips in Vancouver. Oh, now you I know. don't have to plug it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, because I want that generation to be able to go, if I buy that, I know it's good because it's got that little logo. We have to make it that easy, right? So next is Safeway, Loblaws, Sobeys, Jimmy Pattison's group, Save on Foods. You know, the next is real movements within, you know, the industry of, of retail because retail is the movement. That's where the fish is, the volume of protein is moved. But it starts with us because we get it in your mouths when you come to our restaurants or to our, to our um, establishments. You know, I feel like an, an incredible legacy ahead of us as a generation that we can actually really positively make change. But we got to start doing it now. I mean, we're all obviously like-minded people because we're here tonight. But you got to go home and tell your people, like, look for OceanWise, look for green, and only buy that. And if, if you, know, you go to a place and they can't answer the question, you know, then you know your answer. And don't buy it. Great, thank you. I, I think that's a, a good segue because you mentioned that. I mean, I think we're really under the binocular here on, on the Pacific Coast, particularly. And so with that, um, maybe it's a good segue to Chef Moonen. Uh, being not from a coastal area, you know, an inland chef, how do we get more chefs and consumers to adopt sustainable seafood? By making it cool. 
I'm making it popular. Seriously, I mean, trends. Why do they call it a trend? Everybody's got their, you know, at the end of every single year, uh, you get the phone calls. What's going to be the next big seafood item next year? <laughs> so what is going to be the be next big seafood <laughs> item? It's not December yet. I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of it is, and I answer this, is diversity. I want to see everything become popular. Because if you, you, you pick one species and we target it, we love it to death. It, we, we, it, it goes away. You know, we, we basically, uh, five fish is about the average amount of, 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 of species that most consumers are willing to even eat when they open up a menu. They don't see tuna, salmon, bass, and, you know, and there are two others that they recognize, done. You know, they see barramundi, cobia, uh, sable. No one knows what sable is generally. I mean, in, in the United States, sable or, or black cod is not something that is, it's not local, so they don't understand it. It's a fantastic fish. And I want to clarify one thing about wild. Wild is definitely the best way to go. We just can't do it anymore because we overdid it. We took this ocean and we thought, this is, oh, look, tons of water. We can just dump our garbage into it, toss everything into it. Major, like all the byproducts of, of industry, just dump it in there. Don't worry about it. Dilution, no problemo, right? And then we're surprised when, because we expect now in return a constant supply of very clean, beautiful uh, products that we can consume daily. And we're surprised when there's methyl mercury in our tuna or something, you know? We need to take better care of our environment. End of story. You know, and that's really I, the key. You know, a little Wild's the best. shout out to, uh, to Frank, actually, and his Unsung Heroes menu. Exactly. Right? Frank is famous, I'm sure, for a decade, maybe, Frank. Has it been that long? He does a celebration menu of Unsung Heroes. I mean, that's really, why are they unsung? Because we don't order them enough. Because yeah. we don't enjoy them enough. Because they're <laughs> weird. Yeah, we're doing what we call trash dinners now. Right? So we get a bunch of chefs, well known, and we're creating these menus out of things that people don't normally, aren't normally comfortable trying. What we're trying to do? We're trying to create a trend. We're trying to get some media behind it going, oh my God, cobia, the next best thing, you know, being farm raised now, tastes like veal, it's delicious. I, I think you take a, you, you take a, a you look at what, what everybody's talking about with pigs, right? The whole pig, the whole hog. Mm -hmm. Why not the whole, the whole fish? The whole yeah. fish. Right? We only want primary cuts of protein. We only want beef tenderloin or ribeye steak. You've seen this real movement in the last decade of secondary cuts, braised, whatever. Yeah. Right? Which Next, taste a lot better. Which actually do taste a lot better and show a lot more technique. Right? So uh, um, you, I'm just going to scratch off my unsung thing because I was going to say that. So, <laughs> but um, I'm honored to have Frank Papp. Yeah, here. he's another too. he's another giant I in the industry. Frank. So Chef Clark, what uh, sustainable seafood that is currently underutilized would you like to see used more often? Did I check that one off as a question? Yes, I you did. Ask? It's <laughs> actually <laughs> no ambiguity Sorry. at all. No, really. Eh? Char. What's that? Char. 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 <laughs> um, well, in, in this in this part of the world, I'd say pink salmon. I would say they're especially every two years they're relatively abundant. Uh, they're underutilized, they're unappreciated, and, uh, and they're, they can be a wonderful, why am I looking at you? They can be a wonderful, uh, they can be a wonderful alternative. At, at, uh, at my place of business, it's one of the... It's, the fish counter. At the fish counter. Um, <laughs> it's turning out to be one of the biggest sellers because its you value is the best. It's, it's, it's one of the cheaper proteins in the display case, and the quality is just as good as the coho that it's sitting next to. Uh, so finding more and more repeat customers are coming back specifically for pink, and um, it's it's a perfectly it's a perfectly good fish. We get a little bit snobbish here in BC, thinking sockeye rocks, which quite frankly it, it doesn't. It's much harder to cook, and uh, it has a lot of flavor. But spring personally, springs coho they're they're really good, really good, much better. Sockeye is just I don't know color. I don't know what it is. I really don't. I really don't. But there's but. Subnote: There's millions coming back this year, so sockeye is what we'll be eating this year. That's one of the things about eating. No, well, that's the thing about the wild salmon, or that's what the thing about where we live here, is people freak out. Oh, you know, uh, the DF, the DFO closes this river to this to this fish, and we panic. Oh, you know, it's a catastrophe. Really, it's a demonstration of, of how how we're working towards being sustainable. Because if 
and God bless the DFO, but um, <laughs> you know, they decide that that year we shouldn't take sockeye from that particular river. That's a, that's a management technique that makes wild salmon a good um, ocean-wise option because we're managing it. This year we shouldn't eat, I mean this year we should eat sockeye, but some years we shouldn't eat sockeye. We should be eating pinks. We should be eating coho. We should be eating springs. This year is a sockeye year. The Fraser apparently is going to be, I don't know, 70 million or 60 million or, you know. It's a 10% probability. Anyway, everybody needs a freezer because there's going to be, <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of sockeye coming back and it's going to be a really reasonable price and we should be celebrating that this year and next year maybe we don't have sockeye. And that's, that is an example of how we've gotten ourselves into trouble as far as our food system, not concer even concerning seafood, but everything is that we feel that because I want sockeye and I want it now, I deserve it because I have some God-given right because I was born here to eat sockeye every year and that's, that's what got us into trouble. Some years we shouldn't eat it. And we should, you can take a look at the entire food chain like that. Some, some years we should eat uh, products and some years we shouldn't. And if we approach it that way, that I think is a sustainable way of, of looking um, at food. I always tell this story. When I was an apprentice in Toronto, you know, young cooks, we didn't have any money, but we still went to bars and drank anyway. And, you know, we would decide, we would, as young apprentices, we would determine who worked in the best hotel simply by, by who had fresh blueberries from New Zealand. Yeah. Like, that is so, so far from, from what we should have been talking about 30 years ago. Um, we should have been talking about my restaurants better because actually we were smart enough to preserve the blueberries last fall and we've frozen some and we've made jam and we've made preserves and we've cured, we've made grab lax and, and all these sorts of things. That's how we really should be eating towards the seasons. It's wild seafood, farm seafood, they all, they all follow a season. Even in the farming, like for mussels and clams, there's, and oysters, there's good months and there's, there's better months to be eating them. They are available 365 days of the year, but certain times of the year, they're much more um, um, apt, they should be enjoyed in certain months. And I just want to now plug the Spot Prawn Festival, which is coming up on May 10th. Our next big season, um, Ling Cod opened this, this weekend, so Ling Cod will be coming. You got lint, fresh Ling Cod? We do. Ling, yeah, so fre fresh Ling Cod. <laughs> Holy Christ. Um, fresh Ling Cod now, so you should be looking for fresh Ling Cod or Ling Cod in, in your markets. The next one's going to be spot prawns, and uh, you know that's one of the success stories here in, in, in Vancouver is how we've taken we've taken a product that was primarily um, exported to Japan, and now we're keeping a certain percentage. I would only be guessing if I, t if I don't know the percentage is staying here, but I know a lot of tonnage is being sold now here in Vancouver and the Spot Prawn Festival. Thousands of people come down and celebrate and embrace this product that even 10 years ago most chefs didn't know know about, or if they did know about it, they would say spot prawns, I don't like them, they're mushy, because simply we were sold the crap. But now, because of, of organizations like Organic Ocean, actually, Steve was the one that uh, co-founded the, the Spot Prawn Festival, and now enables us all to enjoy uh, fresh spot prawns in May, May and June, so I encourage you to get out there and, and get them. Was there a question there? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, maybe we should just move on. Yeah, move on. Let's move on. <laughs> So Chef Bell, I mean, that's a good segue though, and uh, uh, Chef Moonen, how important is seasonality in, in your menu? It's all the season. Menu? Extremely. So, well, those are ahead. nice short answers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's everything to me, and when I write menus, I write menus based on season. You know, for sure, I think we do expect strawberries and asparagus, you know, 12 months of the year, right? And I think that there's something really exciting about halibut season, you know, or wild salmon season, or spot prawn season, or still strawberry season, or blueberry season, or what have you, but seasonality to me as a chef excites me, it, ex it, it excites my peers, it excites, I mean, we have 400 staff at our hotel, you know, it excites them when I get to put seasonal products in the staff cafeteria, because I know that they're going to then potentially go home and look for it in the grocery stores. Is there, a, is there a latest trend that you're that in seafood or an underutilized species that you'd like to use more often? Um, I'm not much of a trend guy, really. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I was cooking nutrient-dense, plant-based a long time ago, but now all of a sudden it's like the hot trend this year, you know? I mean, put more vegetables on your plate. You know, my name's not Michael Pollan, but I certainly you know, love what he's, the message that he's been able to sort of move forward. More veg, less, less quantity of protein. You're just a better human, you're healthier, you know. 
run around Stanley Park a couple times a week and you don't have to do that to I just I started you, right? I started a health and wellness committee on the Chef's Table Society and my goal is to try and get chefs to go up the grouse grind with me this year. So Rob Clark, are you coming? Yes I am. <laughs> I am. You all heard it. Could be my Chef I think it's great to be able to anticipate and look forward to something. I mean, you know, Christmas comes once a year. What if there's Christmas every month? What's up? You know, you look up, you really look forward to it. So seasonality, looking forward to it. In the United States, we have soft shell crabs. These are blue crabs that shed their, their, uh, their um, you know, they, they molt. And at that point, they're very soft. You can cook the whole thing. And we go, oh, it's a big festival. Like spot prawns, like the festivals that you experience up here. You know, I'm just talking about a different environment. We have stone crabs, you know, seasons. You know, halibut, we're enjoying a halibut season right now in my restaurant. I have halibut all over my menu. It's fantastic that I get from Steve Johansson, you know, that, you know, and, and um, so that's how we need to live, you know, is like when the run is, you know, when's the king salmon run, when's the sockeye, when's the pink, you know, and you know it. And you, and you also need to be, um, at least in the United States, on top of current events. You know, one of the biggest, or the biggest, I believe, uh, source of sockeye salmon in the market globally comes from one area, Bristol Bay. And it's a series of beautiful rivers. And everything's great, and no one lives there, so no one really cares. It just it just comes and appears every year. And they're looking at the, the headwaters of these rivers, and they found that there's a tremendous deposit of, of copper and gold. Ooh. So they want to do an open pit mine called Pebble Mine. If that becomes a reality, say goodbye to the number one source of sockeye salmon globally. Doesn't make sense. You need to be in opposition to it. So I've been very vocal about being opposed to this mine going into uh, the headwaters of, the, of, of these ri the river system in, in uh, Bristol Bay. So current events, support, you know, awareness, all the diversity, understanding eating lower on the food chain when they are possible. You do that, less health concerns. Lower on the food chain is always less, uh, you know, a concentration of PCBs, methyl mercury, all the wonderful things that we toss in the ocean to surprise come back in the flesh of the larger predatory species because they've been around longer and they've eaten a lot more, so it concentrates. You know, a lot of what we're talking about is really common sense. It's like old becomes new, new becomes old. Now, the new trend is, let's see how nature has been doing it, and maybe we'll mirror that, and that's a good idea. It's taken a long time, but we're finally getting there, and that's exciting. Great, thank you. So, uh, Chef Clark, another loaded question. Um, we've done a lot to uh, promote organic ocean tonight. And Albion seafood. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Albion actually, no. Given the choice, would you choose a local sustainable seafood or a sustainable seafood that's creating a positive socioeconomic uh, impact in a, in a developing country? I'd always pick local. Local is, uh, regardless of the, the question or the context, local is always a better option um, than... Um, and that's, that could be social, economical, uh, environmental. And why is it a better option? I don't know the answer. No. Well, <laughs> the thing, I was, actually, prawns are the perfect, pr let's use prawns. Let's use tiger prawns. So up until about well, 10 years ago, let's say 10 years ago and before, they were farming tiger prawns in Asia, packing them up into boxes, and shipping them to North America. And then North America, we were catching all these wonderful spot prawns, packing them up into boxes, and shipping them to Asia. <laughs> now that makes no sense. I don't, I, I, I would, I cannot imagine somebody talking me, in, uh, rebuttaling that and then making any sense on any level. So, I mean, so that's as one, ex one example. Why would, why would we do that? Why would we, why would I, in the context that they, they exist in both, right? If you say, would I buy an organic lemon or, uh, sorry, uh, a sustainable lemon or a sustainable carrot, well, I have to buy the lemon from, from uh, Correct. Yeah. it has to be imported. That, that's not, it, we can never, in the context that we're always referring to it, it's, it, could, be, it could be produced here or, or it does exist here, uh, it's indigenous to here, it would always be local. And then it supports your local economy. Since I think that education, education probably would make most of the problems in the world go away, regardless of what we're talking about. And in this case, we're talking about uh, sustainable seafood. Um, so if we, we need to take the responsibility of educating ourselves. If I talk about sustainable seafood with 
say my mother, she puts her hands in the air like I do when I'm trying to figure out Italian wine and just go, oh, it's too complicated, I'm just going to buy whatever's at the store. Um, that's, not the, that's not the answer. Uh, confusing us and making it complicated is actually the goal so that we do give up and we, and we purchase mindlessly. Um, if you go to, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here go to farmer's markets. I'm willing to bet that your experience shopping in the, the farmer's market is probably uh, much more rewarding than it is going to a local grocery store. And I got nothing against IGA or Safeway. I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting that they're, they're evil. But my experience, I know, is when I go to a farmer's market, it's, it's more rewarding. It's more rewarding because you're talking to the person that actually produced what you're buying. And you can feel and get a sense of their, their passion, their connection to what they did. And that, whether we'll admit it or not, is, is beneficial to us. Just like walking near a, f a stream, whether you like water or not, whether you like mosquitoes or flies, I guarantee you, you walk near a, a moving body of water and you will feel better after. That's just... It's just the way we are. It's, we've been like that for tens of thousands of years, of hundreds of thousands of years, however long we've been around. So connecting to your food is this, I think, is the single most important thing you can do. And the only way that you can actually really know what's going on is if you are connected. Because if the more people are in between, and that would mean that the further away your food comes from, chances are the more people have been involved in getting it to you. Um, the disconnect is is basically what's got us into this situation. So, you know. The closer you are is, is, is always better from, 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 for our health all around. And then we don't, don't even want to talk about carbon credits and, and the, the consumption of fuel to actually move food around the planet it makes no sense. So um, I don't know. I, I don't want to be misunderstood here because I often when I talk about the 100-mile menu, again, people throw their hands up in the air and go, oh, I'm not giving up bananas. It's not about giving up bananas. Bananas are very good for you. They're high in potassium. Mangoes are great, whatever. It's not about that. It's about whatever is local, supporting local, and that will make for a healthy environment. It'll make a healthy economy, and it will connect you to your food source, and therefore you will become healthier whether you want to, to or not. Okay. Chef Bell, do you, think, do you feel the same way? About local versus global? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the First Nations community is pretty... Um, pretty telling in that if you take care of a community, it takes care of itself. Um, you know, for me, we're, in, again, we're so incredibly fortunate to live in, on the West Coast. We have an abundant, you know, BC, the Okanagan, the Fraser Valley, it's the breadbasket of our province for growing fruits and vegetables. So we're extraordinarily lucky. You know, I, my dad was the first hydroponic tomato farmer in the Okanagan in the early 70s. I'm fairly certain he was growing other things hydroponically. <laughs> It is BC. My name all. is Ned, after all. But, um, you know, it's all about supporting local. I, the, I love, I mean, I, we all have to shop in major retailers. You know, major retailers make our life easy. We're all busy, dual income, single parent, you know, trying to raise families, have careers. Um, you know, major retailers are phenomenal. They're necessary for us to be able to one-stop shop to a certain degree. But I'll tell you, I, way, I, I feel way more connected to the product when I go to a local butcher, a local fishmonger, a local bakery, a local cheese um, manufacturer, because I know that I'm talking to the guy who actually might have caught the fish or knows the guy who caught the fish and can probably tell me where it came from or somebody who might have milled the flour. I mean, like you said earlier, it's, it's common sense. I mean, and we're not asking that you have to shop at said fishmonger every single time you go shopping. But hey, but if let's... if you are on Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are on Main... You know, I, was, I went to the farmer's market on Saturday, a little personal story. My little boy, Max, we just finished hockey, and usually we go for crepes. And the crepe guy wasn't there, and I was really frustrated. And, were, and he's like, okay, Daddy, let's go for fish and chips, because we have a bit of a ritual to go for fish and chips after swimming and hockey. And there was a lineup like halfway down the block at your place. And I thought to myself, I'm not waiting 45 minutes <laughs> for fish and chips, even if it is the best fish and chips in the city. What are you, I just, Yeah, really. I, just want to articulate I wasn't on my answer, but that, go okay. ahead. So, is, is, and when I speak about buying local or uh, using lemons as the example, like, so there's three of us here, but and Ned's and my decision concerning one item would probably be more the same. What uh, Rick has to decide is different, right? So being in Vegas, mm -hmm. his decision on, let's say, where he gets shrimp from is a much different decision than Ned's and mine. Because 
They're not growing shrimp in the desert, so he has to bring it from somewhere. So, not yet. Okay. So his 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 uh, checklist of how I just how he decides where it comes from will be much different than Ned's and mine. But it's it's no better nor worse. It just it, the circumstance makes it different, right? It's funny though. But you, what people don't realize is that just uh, geographically. Las Vegas is closer to more organic farms than Los Angeles. But no one talks about Los Angeles having an issue with, uh, with, with organics. I get a lot, of, I source a lot of my seafood from the Pacific, because I'm closer there, from LA, what's coming out of there, on up, on up the Pacific coast, on up into Vancouver and in BC, where there's fantastic products. Why wouldn't I, especially when they're in season? You know, it's funny that you mentioned connection, because <clears throat> it, it's well known, you know, that. It, it, if you drink, if you travel a lot, the water change, your body can't handle it. You're used to where you live. You're happier where you live. You eat the bee pollen at the farmer's market, the local bee uh, pollen, and you're gonna have less issues with, with uh, allergies because it, it, it helps to strengthen your immune system because you are, are, are connected to a place. So local, always matters. Always, there's no question about it. And of course, I have issues because I'm in the desert, but there's a lot growing out there. There's a lot available out there. I'm one hour away from getting, you know, really good products, you know. And I, when I worked in New York City, you know, we'd get fish from Long Island. And if you've ever were out there, if you ever drove from Long Island to New York, it's two, three hours a lot of time. So that fish takes a lot longer from Long Island to get into New York than it does to get into the, to the desert. And so, you, since, you know, I work for a company. Um, who have 90 hotels around the world, and we have, you know, I mean, I'm a capitalist. I like my partners to make money. I like to, I like to make money. I have a business to run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have Caesar salad on the menu because people want Caesar salad. You know, no matter where I go in the world, I want to have Caesar salad. Unfortunately, so that means I have to have romaine lettuce from somewhere, always on my menu. You know, there's really no different. Of course, local's the answer, but unfortunately, we or fortunately, we do live in a global society and we live in Vancouver South Asian Asian population it's it adds value for our our culture our cuisine our people um, you know I, I love the the dynamic of enjoying cuisines and cultures from all over the world you know my my family's blended you know for for that exact reason um, you know I was raised in Vancouver for crying out loud you know we do live in one of the best cities in the world period we do live in one of the best countries in the world period we actually are partner neighbors to one of the other best countries in the world <laughs> which one's period <laughs> period, period. <laughs> but it's but you know I mean it kind of leads me into a question that you haven't a asked me but thanks for asking it guy um, <laughs> National Sustainable Seafood Day is an initiative that we're trying to launch, which is really could be in the United States. There's only other one country in the world that celebrates a day nationally sustainable seafood, and that's Australia, and that's March 18th. So we chose March 18th in this country to try and raise awareness to try and raise awareness uh, for national sustainable seafood and um, for seafood across our country, where it's really as much about flying down the middle, not benefiting any NGO specifically, not benefiting, not benefiting any government body specifically or any political party sp specifically, kind of like Caesar salad, right down the middle of the fairway, right? Like a three wood. You know, when I was a young boy on the golf course and I always wanted to pull out my driver and rip it in the trees, my dad would always look at me like, what are you doing? You know, you're going to hit three down the middle with your driver. You're going to hit eight down the middle with your three wood. And, you know, what we've got to try and do is rely on consistency, rely on sharing culture and, and globalization, but choosing local wherever we might be. So, you guys um, like the questions Ben is asking us? Or <laughs> you like that? Thank you. <laughs> I spent a lot of time working on this as I'm driving up to Whistler. <laughs> But um, we talk about local, and we spend a lot of time talking about sustainable seafood, but really this is the future of seafood. So are there other factors that influence your decision making when, you're, when you choose seafood? So why don't we ask all of you, so Chef Bell. Well, you know, personally I love to try new things, um, but I also love a busy restaurant. So I want to have things on the menu that create a busy restaurant. 
And I think there's a percentage, let's say it's 60% that is the safe three woods down the middle of the fairway, like, you know, the, the sockeye salmons, the halibut, the what have you. And then there's the 30% of the menu where you take risks, right? There's the, the sustained, like the unsung heroes that Frank, you know, my dream is that Frank's able to have an unsung hero menu all year long. You know, that's, that's a dream. Pardon me? That would be an accomplishment. Would be an accomplishment. If he was able to sell enough of that, I mean, it might take away from how special it is currently, but first of all, 10 years, pretty damn special. You know, clearly there's enough people that look forward to Unsung Heroes menu, just the same as we look forward to, you know, wild strawberries in season. Um, but it wouldn't it be cool if, you know, you knew that you could go and get that menu at Blue Water and maybe at UC Food and Bar and, and some evolution of some other awesome seafood restaurant that might open up here in the future, RM Seafood Vancouver. Yep, coming soon. Um, you know, I mean, who knows, right? It's, it's about raising awareness and education because when you, the consumer, ask for it, we'll put it on the menu. But if you don't ask for it, we're not putting it on the menu because it's not going to sell. Chef Moon, how about yourself? Well... Um, other, other factors that you would consider uh, when, when deciding to put a, a, a fish on your menu, is that the question? Yes. Well, price, of course, you know, and, 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 and seasonality, quality, I mean, how many, how many hands it had to go through to get to you before you prepare it to serve it. But um, I think that, uh, let's go with that. Come back to it. I'll come back. Come back to me. All right. Go, Roger. Chef Clark? Oh, you know what? Okay, now I remember what it was. Uh -huh. I oh, we, didn't, we didn't really talk about habitat destruction. You know, I mean, there's how, how that fish was caught. If it's wild and they're going after it, and they're dragging these gigantic uh, gear to just get everything off the ocean floor, and they bring up all this stuff, you know, and what percentage of it is what they actually were targeting? All this other stuff called bycatch gets tossed overboard because they don't have a license for it, they have no interest in it, it's not going to sell in the market. So this tremendously um, wasteful uh, you know, a uh, method of doing it, and, and they destroying the habitat as they're going through it. It's like clear cutting Stanley Park to get a deer for dinner. You know, what, do, now now what are you going to do? You know, you just destroyed where they they, they need um, uh, that environment is where they chose to live because they can they can live whenever wherever they want. And you're destroying their 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 home, and so you're basically painting them in a corner. Just so that that basically is is taking part in a uh, action. That, that, that is bringing a, a, a possibility of extinction to that targeted species. So um, that's another factor that we take into account. Now, ocean-wise takes all that stuff into account for you. So when you see the ocean-wise, you know, because there's a lot of stuff. You've got overfishing, bycatch, you know, aquaculture. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. You know, I mean, you, you can't keep your finger on the pulse of everything. And that's why uh, good um, branding, you know, Place, people that are credible, that you, you, you can trust. And, and aquariums are a really good place to start, to be honest with you, because they really care. There's a lot of science that goes into the um, Oceanwise program, as well as, well, I'd say, Seafood Watch, but you, you, that's from the U.S. Um, these are credible um, assessment, I hate to say brands, but that's kind of what it is, MSC. MSC is good, Marine Stewardship Council. You know, there's, that, that's been approved in... in, in, in the, the chain of custody and everything that goes behind that label is, is proven to be very sustainable in, you know, uh, as it is structured. So when you learn that handful of things to look for and you do so, you're, you're changing the world one fish at a time, which is awesome. So Chef Clark, I, I'd like to come back to you on that, but uh, Chef Moonen, just to segue into that, you, you talked about... Um, you talked about those uh, brands, and uh, do do you think we in the seafood industry do a good job at that brands? I mean, we talk about tra trash dinners. I don't know about you, but it doesn't sound very sexy to me. No, it doesn't, and it's tongue in cheek. The whole thing is funny because as at the end of the meal, like, well, that was awesome. And see, it's not so trashy now, is it? See, that's just the whole idea is to try to say, look, there's a lot of incredible available biomass, and I'm sorry to call it biomass, sound ooh, but that's what we need to, to survive and eat. And if we could just like get off the five species and start to, like on Tuesday, instead of eating tuna every Tuesday, let's eat something different. Let's eat a fish that we're not um, exactly accustomed to, but let's go to a credible source, right? Right here, credible source. They're doing their homework for you, you know? Now labeling is I'm kind of avoiding it because I, I fear 
that it gets what they call greenwashed. You know, the word sustainable becomes what organic. Organic used to mean something, right? And then everybody said, oh, we're organic. Not, sorry about that, Steve, not you. But I'm just saying, it, 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 is a, uh, it got diluted because it got greenwashed out. So everybody just says, yeah, we're doing it too. Yeah, we're great. We're sustainable. They're, they're their own definition of sustainable. So you need credible sources so you know that what you're actually looking for is the real deal. So I didn't know, you know, because everybody's trying to run a business at the end of the day. So we're doing a good job now, and I hope that it doesn't get diluted with the, with what I call it blue washing, with, with uh, labels that just don't make any sense. Chip, Bill? No, I was just going to say, um, you know, every Monday I call Dennis Matarolo at Albion Fish. Albion. At Albion Fisheries, and I say, Dennis, what can you, what, what do you got this week? What can you bring me? What's cool? What's new? What's different? First of all, what's sustainable? But he knows that by now. So he and I are having that conversation on a weekly basis, right? Because we're thinking of what are we going to bring in that we're going to put on features. So I put this question or this request to you. You know, when you go out for dinner, you know what you're going to go out for dinner for, right? You, you're not going to go out for everything. You're going. I feel like Italian tonight. I feel like. French tonight, I feel like sushi, I feel like seafood. So the next time you make a reservation, maybe say to the hostess, hey, I'm really interested, because th what I love to do is cook for you. And I, I love cooking off the menu, right? And most really good chefs love cooking off the menu, right? Can't guarantee all chefs do, but most real, true, authentic culinarians love cooking off the menu. So when you make a reservation at, at my restaurant or at Blue Water or at See or, or even when you call up Rob Clark and you say, "Hey, Rob, I'm coming for a party. <laughs> I have a party this weekend, but I want something different." Tell the hostess, tell Ned to bring something different in, and I'll bring something different in. And trust me, tell me your preferences. I don't like to call them allergies. If they're allergies, great, because maybe they're just preferences. Because everybody loves to say I'm allergic to something when they're actually just don't like it. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? But like, why not, right? Because it starts with you, the consumer, to come and say, I want to try something different. Because you all are going to come to our restaurants and see halibut, or spot prawns, or salmon, or albacore tuna, or you know, maybe qualicum scallops, or mussels and clams, or oysters, or whatever. But you're probably not going to see gooseneck barnacles, or you're probably not going to see abalone, or you're probably not going to see humble squid, or you're probably not going to see sardines, or whatever. But you want to try it, right? Right? Yeah. Right. So ask for it. But if you don't ask for it, we can't give it to you. And if we don't give it to you, Steve doesn't know to pull it out of the ocean. If he doesn't pull it out of the ocean, then how the hell do we get it on your plate? And then how do you know to go to the grocery store and buy it? That's, that's what we have to do. We have to stop eating beef tenderloin every time we eat beef. Supply and demand. Right? Simple. So next time you make a reservation, ask. Yeah. Say, tell Chef Frank Pabst to cook me something. <laughs> 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 Okay, ask me. Give us at least $48. No, for sure, but I mean, you know when you're gonna when you're gonna go eat at Blue Water, you probably made the reservation two weeks ago because they're doing 300 people every night, right? They're packed, so you don't just walk into the place. So you make a reservation two weeks out, right? T say, it's probably a special experience, right? You're gonna spend 200 bucks on dinner. It's probably something special. So hey, serve me something special. And then you might fall in love with something new. And you fall in love with something new. Isn't that what we're all about? Falling in, in love with something new? I it's mean, a nice I, segue to the vision of the future of seafood. <laughs> Chef, Chef Clark, how about yourself? Is there other things that you choose? I mean, you're, you've been an advocate, proponent for sustainable seafood, but, and we talked about local. What other things do come into your decision making? What, what factors oh, back influence to that question. you? Um, well, um, I also take into, or I try to take into account the, uh, uh, the perception of it. Is it. So for example, like I'm 100% ocean-wise, I support ocean-wise, but just because the product is ocean-wise doesn't mean that I will, I will sell it. Um, and no offense to ocean-wise, but that's just, that's just the way it is. So they have like ocean-wise shrimp that would not, I would not, 
I don't have a problem with it. It's just it's not me to, to sell it. I would sooner sell something local than that, that social wise than, than something that's not local. Um, I also take into account if there's, um, and I've always done this, even my years at sea, that's how we all actually got into that. That is, if it's something bigger or something more than just um, the sustainability aspect of it. So I'm always looking for a story. And originally the stories weren't about marketing, but it turned out that stories actually help marketing. But for me it was about, and, and the Hawkshaws are a perfect example, the salmon we used to get from them. It's about, a, it's about if, if somebody's producing a product that they're not, um, they're not getting the appreciation or the dollar value for it, even though they're putting in so much more effort than the, than the boat next to them. I like to I like to, to be the conduit for that for that story and to, and to get their to get their product to in the case, in the in the restaurant scene it was very it was very easy because you just throw it on the menu and, and 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 on menus were always well not always but with the whole evolution of sustainability we we began to to uh, to name the fishermen like you would a farmer and the boat and and where it came from the river of origin in the case of salmon like these things you all if you look back at menus. 15 years ago, you're going to see. 20 years ago, you'll never, you would never see it. Um, but now, over time, and now it's it's common. I mean, you'd be bizarre to go into a restaurant here and they not tell you where the sockeye salmon came, came from, as an example. Uh, so I look for those opportunities as well. I think that's that's important. And the whole, I mean, what we're doing, it's a, it's about something more than it's bigger than us. Like Ned, Ned cycling across the country, and and. But it's bigger than him cycling across the country. He's doing it for something bigger and more important. And, and that's, that's what this whole thing is about. And everybody in this room that participates in the sustainability movement and, 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 uh, and how we produce and source our fish, it's about something more than ourselves. And, I, and for me, that's always played a bigger, a bigger role. Like, honestly, I'd sooner not be here. I think tonight, right? I have, but it's, it's important. It's more important than, than what me drinking at you, right? <laughs> if on. any of us were doing this for ourselves, you would see through that transparently, right? I mean, there's an authenticity to the three of us up here. You know, m my journey across the country is called Chefs for Oceans. It's not Ned for Oceans. You know, it's the wobbly soapbox that I stand on, maybe because I have, you know, a passion for something. I, I feel like I need to leave a legacy of it, right? And, you know, I have two boys. I want to make sure that they know that seafood comes from a fisherman, not from a styrofoam container with cellophane on top. You know, I mean, it comes from a river. It comes from a person. It comes from the ocean. Um, but for me, there's an authenticity to probably everybody in this room because we're here tonight. But how do we spread the message beyond us through whether traditional media or social media? I mean, you're probably all on Facebook or Twitter. I mean, send the message. You know, Fred Hawkshaw is a great example of a guy who's like nobody is more passionate than him on Facebook for his product, right? Like nobody. I mean, the guy goes nuts and, you know, letters like that. But if he can't get his message out, I mean, I have this discussion with Steve all the time. He always says to me, you know, we pay a little bit more for our halibut because we know he's doing it the right way. You know, I buy the majority of my halibut from Albion. I buy some halibut from, from Steve. I'm buying, buying the halibut for di the dinner that we're doing with Rick on Saturday from Steve, you know, but I definitely have the majority of my fish from Albion. It's not about only buying from one person or only going to the fish counter all the time. It's about making the right decisions when you have a decision to make and asking the question. So, thank you. I mean, we talk about how, um, how consumers and customers make a, 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 can be a real um, a part of the decision-making process. So, I mean, I've talked enough here. Why don't we uh, open up some questions to uh, the audience here? Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask the panel? Ask Rick. Ask <laughs> Rob. Sorry. So, yeah. How is the rest of the world embracing sustainability? 
Well, I want to so think. let me just repeat the question for the people that are online, if you don't mind. Um, so from a globalization perspective, how, do, how is the rest of the world embracing sustainable seafood? Is that what you're asking? Go ahead, Chef. Quickly tackle. First of all, you know when you're having a really bad day and all your problems are the gray cloud or black cloud over you? What does my wife always tell me is focus on one thing at a time, right? We can't worry about the whole world all the time. We can only worry about our decisions. Globally, there are some incredible organizations, NGOs, doing some incredible work, not dissimilar from the OceanWise program or Sea Choice. I think that what we have to do is continue to worry about this part of our world and try and pay a little bit more attention to what's going on in the world through traditional and non-traditional media. But, I mean, Black tiger prawns are, are the most consumed seafood on the planet. So, you know, maybe globally, and, and I don't want to make a definitive statement, but maybe think about not consuming those as much as we do as, as, as a, such a significant consumption globally, and maybe we start to affect some change. You can only do a couple of things in your life, right? So start making a couple of decisions that make a difference. Chef Moon and Chef Clark, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Rob, tell them. I was waiting for you, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think Ned really answered that question really well. Not everybody has the same focus. Those that don't have the same focus are going to find out that they're going to need to, or hopefully they already are because we're at, a, we're at a critical point right now as we, are, as we grow in population. There's no more, we're having a discussion today, but this is a call to arms, you know, and the good news is we're in a good place, you know. The hospitality industry, the chef world, we're dying for diversity, we're dying for new stuff. I'm sick and tired of pork, chicken, and beef, you know, and just a handful of seafood that people are cool with. I wanna see it go. Because, you know, it's just like working on a factory. If you've got to work with the same things all the time, it's not inspiring. And this is a craft. This is an art. We want that diversity. And I think, I know from the 35 years that I've been in the hospitality industry that I see a major tipping point happening right now. I hate even to use the word trend, but environmental, sustainability, local is the new trend. Thank God. So globally... Um, some countries certainly have to catch up to certain other ones, but we don't. We all have to play nice in a little sandbox, you know. And you can't wait for everybody else to do the same thing. Otherwise, I'm not. No, just lead by example. Lead by example and celebrate it. We got great food, great sources. Let's and great chefs trying to make it tasty for you. Let's celebrate that, and we'll make anybody who's not doing it jealous. Great, jealous? thank you. Jealous. Yeah. Nice. Join the team. Chef Park, you good with that? I'm great with that. Those guys were good. <laughs> okay, how, over here. Um, well, the first thing is a comment, and the second thing is a question. My first comment is a friend of mine was at a huge health conference in um, L.A. recently, and Andrew Blyle was one of the speakers, and he said, you should not eat fish more than twice a week because it's so so I came in late and I didn't hear what Chef Lunin was saying about the pollution, but I think that Andrew Whale has a lot of followers and, you know, with, with that sort of statement, he takes some pressure off the demand for seafood. But um, I don't know, so I don't know whether ocean-wise, and I just went on my phone to see if I could see if they state anything about pollution. Other than the mercury, you've seen the, the mercury. Uh, can I have this one? I, yeah. I would like to know that. Well, we, it could be an hour discussion. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah. I, yeah. lots to say to that. Um, see, so I mentioned that earlier, like comparing the same with comparing the advantages or disadvantages to farm salmon. Like they didn't compare to the consumption of fish to pork, beef, or chicken. Uh, and if any of us have done any research on how the, generally chicken are produced or pork are produced or beef, they, if they were side by side with seafood, I'm pretty sure seafood would be, I mean, I'm not a doctor, I'm not gonna go against, but logic would, 
there, there's different food groups, right? Some foods, the more you eat, the healthier you are. Some foods are benign or it doesn't matter. And some foods, uh, the more you eat, probably the more unhealthy you become. So just... Uh, can I even? See? Yeah, I don't. I don't work for any large company. I can you say, say whatever, whatever I want. Right? <laughs> so, so I think it's pretty common knowledge that if you eat a lot of pork and beef, it's not going to be healthy for you. You need to eat that in moderation. You probably can eat as much chicken as you want, and it's pretty benign. But study after study after study says the more seafood you eat, the healthier you are. So I would say. The ben and I've, I've read studies on it, again, who these studies are from, who they are, who the hell knows who they are, but they say that, the, that what I've read, that the, the health benefits of seafood outweigh any negative impact from heavy metals or PCB, TN, not TNT, DDT, all this sort of stuff. You know, like, it out, the health benefits of it outweigh, outweigh uh, any, any problems concerning that. Uh, any society that's been based on a seafood diet are much healthier than North Americans. We, didn't, we historically have not consumed enough seafood. Um, and of course there's examples or examples of where there's been a major fuck up and there's heavy mercury in, in certain populations. But as a, as a whole, seafood is, is a much healthier option. Um, and we haven't even touched on, when you talk about white elephant, the real white, the real white elephant in... Don't say it. Okay. Radiation. Oh, oh. He said it. Yeah, but our cell phones probably cause more damage than living next to power lines probably causes more damage than anything that'll come. Bananas. Yeah. Bananas. Oh, there you see. Bananas cause damage. Yeah. You know, so, but, yeah. But that was more, uh, I think most of the people in the room here are probably fairly well educated about that. So it was more a statement that that might take some, some pressure off because if the average person hears that. But yet, I couldn't agree more with what Chef Boonin said about diversity, because yeah. when you've got seven to nine billion people on the planet, they all get on a trend like quinoa. Yeah, it's yeah, a good you've example. Seen what happens. The so explodes. That diversity is great, and I didn't know I could go to your, to you and, and order in advance and say... Not to hey, me, to him. It's <laughs> 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 the four C's. No, not it's you, yeah. Y-E-W, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Um, have a larger role in educating their cu customers, and they realize. Absolutely, and we can. And you've got you've got a a um, captive audience sitting there. You could put some more stuff. No, in I think well, but I think the way food has moved in North America in the last forty years, thirty years, it's all been chef driven. Like uh, retailers can can maybe pat their sell out. There's probably at some point, and every time I'm on a panel, I will upset somebody. So if I haven't done it yet, now is probably going to be the time. But Retailers, is they won't bring in, let's, um, Fleur de Sel. You could go to any grocery store for 10 years and ask for Fleur de Sel, and they're not, at some point, they'll start to bring it in. They would never go, hey, there's this great salt from France, maybe we should sell it. It takes hundreds of chefs putting hundreds of recipes and hundreds of newspapers saying, and sprinkle with Fleur de Sel. Then my mother writes down, no idea what it is, but writes it down. Goes and says, do you have Florida sell? Don't know what it is. First couple of years. But eventually they start to sell it. Organic, organics, I don't know about in the States, and organics in Canada, without a doubt, um, the, we would still be eating iceberg lettuce, except for the organic movement where they started to introduce, you know, microgreens for lack of, or mescaline or herbs and stuff. That wasn't put on the grocery shelf until chefs doing, working with local producers served it in their menus, in their restaurant. 10, 12 years before people accepted, you know what, there's more to a salad than iceberg, and, and I like iceberg lettuce, it has its applications. Um, but it was chefs that brought that. The balsamic vinegar, it was chefs. It was these, and I'm talking to, to, to mainstream, right? The ethnic communities will always stick to, have always traditionally stick to what they know and, and imported from home, but for, when I refer to Canadians, I refer to my mother, she's just a typical average Canadian, and everything that she's, Weighed from has been chef driven because it didn't show up to the marketplace until chefs introduced it. And so, chefs, we know that we have that power. We know that that's our responsibility. We know that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, is because we know, especially with the Food Network and all that sort of. I, I shake my head. If I open up a newspaper and there's a recipe for Chilean sea bass in Vancouver, I go, what? A. Like, I, there's, that's, the ball was dropped like nine times for me to be looking at that in a newspaper it just makes no sense to me personally. 
Chef Bell and Chef Moonen, you have some. Oh, there. should I stop? <laughs> I, you know, Canada, we, am I on? I can't, I don't know if I'm on. We live in a country of 35 million people. Um, two billion people rely on the world's oceans for their daily source of protein. So you, you think about two thirds of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline. And that's at seven billion people. So those areas are gonna to continue to get overpopulated to the point of two, of two more billion, nine billion by 2050. We're not gonna stop eating seafood. We can't. You think about the two billion people that are eating protein from the oceans daily, they're not all eating halibut and salmon. So your, your point is absolutely correct in its diversity. The rest of the world is eating really diverse. They're just taking too much from the ocean. So we have to try and replace that protein because we do need to replace that protein in our diet. Now, whether that's animal protein or other types of protein that's created, um, you know, humans are creatures of habit. I have the, kind of the same thing for breakfast every day of the week. I'm sure you all do too. Yogurt. If you eat breakfast, <laughs> right? You know, when we go out for dinner, we go out for probably four or five of the same types of dinners on a monthly basis. I want to see my guests five times a month. I'm hoping that they order something really unique and diverse, but for the most part, they're gonna order the same things. This is, we, we're humans, we're kind of boring. Well, we are, right? I mean, we're, we're creatures of habit. So it's about introducing diversity, but then actually it's about you ordering it, trying it, enjoying it, and ordering it again. Chef Moon? I think that being told, do you hear me? Is this on? I think that being told that you shouldn't consume seafood more than twice a week is very narrow-minded. I'm sorry, I take issue with that. Why? I mentioned it earlier, we're oceans walking around skin holding us together, right? How many people in this room have heard of omega-3s? Oh, is it good for you? Yes, it's good for you. So the concern could be the pollutants or whatever you find in, in the flesh. They end up in the species that are on the top of the food chain. And we, of course, being men, we have to eat off the top of the food chain. That has to change. Our diversity that you've heard 25, 30 times in this discussion over the last hour has been thrown out there, and it's serious. You want diversity in your food? You're going to find it in the ocean. We haven't even scratched the surface of what we can be eating for dinner, yet we don't. So eating the same thing twice a week off the top of the food chain is probably not a great idea, but it's loaded with omega-3s. That's good for your brain, your heart, your whole body. It's fantastic for you. People are taking pills, popping rancid fish oils every day to make sure that they're strong enough. Eat fish, eat food, eat real food, eat more vegetables. That is what should be being preached, and in my opinion. Some, take some messages from other culture, right? I mean, last night we were at Vidges for dinner. Yeah. We could have just as easily had crickets in our meal, right? There are, there are other things to eat in the world. You know, we just happen to be kind of boring. Okay, we've got uh, time for one more question. Wow. Chef Buddha, uh, can uh -oh. you talk a bit more about, when I met you a few weeks ago, you talked about non-native species and sort of using those and you told me about the lionfish. Oh, well. okay, all right. Well, invasive yeah. species are what you're talking yeah. about. Ooh, this is, this is a topic that I have, I struggle with. Because uh, what happens is, when you introduce a species that doesn't belong somewhere, such as a lionfish, which is from the South Pacific, into the South Atlantic, where the temperature, the water temperate-wise, is perfect for them, but guess what? You just introduce them into an environment where they have no enemies. So you just had a gang move into your, your, uh, your neighborhood, and they're just going to take over because nothing's going to stop them. You know, so this is a lionfish situation. It just upsets me because, uh-oh, these lionfish are starting to eat up the reefs. They're killing everything. They eat 50 different species for dinner, lionfish. It's, everything's on their menu, and nothing can get at them because they've got these poisonous spines around them. You can't catch them all because you have to spearfish them in order to get them. We want you chefs to come up with some great recipes so that we can create a demand so we capture all these lionfish, and they'll all be gone, and then we're going to solve the problem. And I go, yeah, no. No, 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 no. We're going to take this fish and make it very popular, and it's going to become a new, you know, going to become a new market. Because guess what? Those guys that are making money off the lionfish now, they're making money. 
All of a sudden, the population starts going down. They're going to figure out how to cultivate it and make it stay alive. So that's a problem. We've got to stop screwing up in the first place. And that's what I really feel. I support, I serve lionfish on my menu because I believe in the idea of it. But ultimately, we got to be smarter. We've got to wake up. We've got to start introducing species that don't belong in the environment in which it, it, it originated. Because lionfish in the South Pacific do have uh, uh, predators, and they are in check. It's just when you put them into another environment where it just doesn't make sense to me. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm sure like everybody else, I, I wish we could stay here for another hour or so asking questions. Um, but unfortunately, that's our time. Uh, hopefully tonight we'll have uh, raised some really thought-provoking discussion for that you can take back to your circle of friends or your family or, or the people you work with about the future of seafood. So I wanted to thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank but, Albion for donating all the seafood you're going to be enjoying. Hey, is this okay? So I, now I'd like to uh, oh, turn it back to uh, Anne-Marie for her <laughs> concluding remarks. <so. laughs> thank you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, chefs, the three chefs here tonight. That was amazing. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm starving. I am really hungry, and we're not feeding you a whole dinner tonight, but we do have some samples. This is the future of seafood, and uh, so we have some albacore tuna um, tacos. We have some side-striped shrimp. You probably haven't tasted that before. It's from our local waters here, and uh, we also have gooseneck barnacles. So I challenge all of you to try something different, which is perfect, um, segue into uh, what, uh, what we heard from these amazing chefs tonight. I'm truly inspired. I love what I do um, working with all the chefs across Canada with OceanWise. And this is the reason is that we have these chefs that are so passionate and really making a difference and challenging all of us to uh, make sustainable seafood a trend and available for all Canadians. Um, as well, we're selling cookbooks outside. This is uh, um, Chef Moonen's uh, cookbook. It's available outside. He'll sign it for you. So please uh, go ahead uh, and get one of those for your for yourself or for friends. A um, couple of other events that are happening. If you enjoyed this tonight, we have a film screening of Watermark. It's a film by Edward Bertinsky on April 15th. As well, you'll see a lot of uh, materials outside for Wine for Waves. That's a fundraiser for the OceanWise program. It's at the Four Seasons on May 2nd, and it's actually the Naramata Naramata Bench Spring Wine release and uh, pairing it up with a number of different restaurants from Naramata and from the Lower Mainland uh, serving tasty ocean-wise sustainable seafood. So please join us for that as well. So thank you um, the chefs. Thank you uh, Guy and LBM for donating the seafood tonight. Please stay and enjoy yourself and uh, speak to the chefs. I know there's a lot more questions. Sorry we didn't get to ask them. But um, please ask them now. So thank you. <laughs>